Good day to everybody. It is August 10th, and we are looking at Isaiah chapters 59 through 63. So let's get right into it. So um, beginning in chapter 59, we, we saw before a couple chapters ago that Isaiah presented an alternative that stands before the people. That is an alternative to judgment. And Isaiah presents that again uh, to the people. So in verse one, it seems that the people are asking in their prayers uh, to God, is your hand too short to save us? Is your ear too dull to hear? And the prophet responds that God could indeed raise a hand or, or lift an ear, but will not do so. The people cannot come into Yahweh's presence to pray. This is not because there are temporary ritual barriers between them and God, um, such as are caused by contact with a corpse, right? Because that makes you one clean. Rather, these can be removed by time and or by a cleansing ritual. The nature of their contact with death, because in some ways Israel is a dead corpse because of their disobedience to the covenant. They are dead in their sins. It's generated the kind of barriers that rituals simply do not address. They do not behave uh, with peace, shalom, uh, and therefore they will not experience it. But nevertheless, there is a prayer, a ritual, a prayer that follows. As a result of being admitted into God's counsel, uh, a prophet in a, is in a position to mediate in both directions. At times, prophets stand between God and the people. And so it's not just bringing God, uh, God's message to the people, but bringing to God uh, the needs of the people. So uh, putting this prayer here suggests that the prophet wants people to see the prayer as part of this message. Um, and this fits with the prayer's content. People pray as if they are practicing righteousness, but there's actually no justice in their walking, in their journey in life. And that is why justice and righteousness are far from them. They sing and pray and talk a good line in worship, but what happens after worship the rest of the week doesn't look like what they're worshiping, praying and singing about. Um, so uh, what gets offered here is a contrition that's appropriate to the people's condition. Um, the prophet seems to be making it on behalf of the people, but will it be heard? Will it be accepted if the people are not contrite? Beginning in 59.15, we get uh, the answer to prayer. When prophets, when we see prophets such as Hosea and Jeremiah pray on behalf of the people, God is uh, inclined to refuse to listen because the people themselves are not committed to acknowledge their wayward ways before God in the way that the prophet does on their behalf. One would then expect that God would take the same stance in relation uh, to the prayer that uh, we read in verses 9 through 15. However, instead of pointing out that there is every reason for God to ignore their prayer, the prophet declares that God is concerned for them and is dismayed that there is no justice, that no one is acting on their behalf. The prophet thus takes uh, the same stance that appears in chapters 40 through 45. If you look back at that, it is no good for Yahweh simply to wait until the people uh, themselves change, that could mean waiting forever. Not a lot of confidence in the people at this point. God has to act on their behalf. And then once they God acts, they will, as the prophet says, fear the name of the Lord. So uh, in this passage here combines past tense verbs um, and future tense verbs as a way of saying it has yet to happen, but it's so certain because God said it will, we can speak of it in past tense as well as future because the event is sure. All right. Now, who did God think should act to restore Israel? Uh, is it a Cyrus-like figure? Uh, but we don't have any mention here of any such person, whether it's a human being or a heavenly being taking action. God is determined to take action personally. Uh, it is not so much a matter of attacking uh, Israel's enemies, uh, and, and, uh, 
but of putting down God's enemies, people who oppose God's purposes, with the aim that the rest of the world should come to acknowledge God. God will then act as Israel's redeemer, um, but this will be effective only for people who turn from their rebellion against Yahweh. God takes the initiative. However, the people must respond. So beginning in 5921, we get another reference to Zion's transformation. So again, these themes keep playing off judgment, mercy, uh, exile, restoration. We get a back and forth in these tensions. This is the world that Isaiah and the people of Judah are living in. Um, the center of chapters 56 through 66, and we're in the middle of that section, is a series of promises that God will restore Jerusalem. The events that uh, followed the fall of Babylon had freed Judeans to return and had led to the rebuilding of the temple. But sources such as Nehemiah indicate that the restoration fell far short of the promises in Isaiah 49 through 54. Uh, now these chapters reaffirm those promises and even in even grander fashion. In, the first pro in these first promises about a gathering of the nations of the city's children, the opening and closing sections here, they form a pair as do the two central sections. The entire chapter portrays a great reversal for the city, especially in re its relationship to the nations, which had up until now been one of strife. Uh, the promises begin with, again, God's commitment. God makes a covenant with the people. Uh, to keep speaking through the prophet and through the prophet's successors, God promises to keep speaking to them. God will not silence his voice. Uh, in beginning in chapter 60, we've got this opening commission to shine, and that is a figure of speech. Uh, the city cannot decide to shine, but it will do so involuntarily because God will shine on it and it will reflect Yahweh's brightness as Moses once did and such brightness will not scare the nations but attract them from their darkness and we can hear the echoes of this in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says you are the light of the world a city set on a hill cannot be hidden um, so uh, the implications here of this shining are spelled out in three ways the nations will bring the city's children back uh, ensuring future generations will worship. They will also bring wealth to the city. And not only will the city enjoy its wealth, but it will also take the form of flocks and other gifts to enhance the worship of God. Um, the three themes starting in verse nine are elaborated upon. Uh, the returning offspring we're told will be so numerous, they will fill scores of ships. The nations that shamed, destroyed and domineered the city will rebuild, beautify, and serve it, and the resources will beautify Yahweh's house, God's house, the temple. Um, starting in 6022, Yahweh, God's own person, stands behind these promises, and God will bring their fulfillment with speed, and that fulfillment yet will come in its time. So it may not be uh, in the people's time when they want it, but it will happen in God's time. When God decides this time has come, the fulfillment will happen in an instant. But the instant doesn't start now. It doesn't start in the immediate moment. Uh, the people who received the prophecy had enough experience of something that they would call a degree of fulfillment. And again, we've seen this before, that um, it begins to be fulfilled, but not completely. And uh, that is yet to come. So these prophecies are fulfilled in some way, but not completely. That is yet to come. All right. Uh, and we get more starting in chapter 61 on, on Israel's transformation or Judah, Judea's transformation. Um, and uh, you have the testimony of the one who is commissioned to proclaim the promises, the spirit of the Lord is upon me um, is an initial description of an earlier promise. God has anointed me. Um, that usually uh, applies only to priests and kings, not prophets, but a 
apparently uh, this prophet uh, understands his calling as an anointing from God. And so it is a distinctive way of proclaiming a divine commission. And by the way, we continue that tradition today in the ordination of pastors because pastors preach and that's what prophets do, they preach. And so by ordaining, we don't use oil as they did in Egypt, but by laying on of hands, we continue this tradition of prophetic anointing. Um, the good news uh, that God is bringing redress to the cities overlords and this liberation to the oppressed people and we can hear Jesus when he uh, gets up to read the scripture the synagogue in Capernaum when we get there he will read from Isaiah 61 the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor to proclaim deliverance to the captives to open the eyes of the blind to set free the prisoners and to proclaim the year of God's favor today this has been fulfilled in your hearing so this prophecy is partially fulfilled in the return of God's people from Babylon but it needs uh, its its complete fulfillment or its further fulfillment uh, needs to wait until the coming of Jesus um, in 61.5, whereas other peoples have prevented Israel from offering proper worship of God or have sought to do so, uh, as well as, of course, by destroying the temple, now they will make it possible for Israel to do so, to worship. And we saw that with the, uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah with the money that the Persians sent uh, to Jerusalem to help rebuild the temple and giving them back the temple artifacts that were taken in the Babylonian exile. Uh, shame will give way to honor, blessing, and joy. Yahweh will stop oppression by other people and will implement this covenant relationship um, in praising God with such enthusiasm. The prophet is doing what Israel is destined to do, behaving even now as if God's promises have been fulfilled. The verses, these verses recall psalms of thanksgiving, which also give anticipatory praise even before the event has actually happened. Uh, in chapter 62, uh, the prophet uh, declares a commitment to pray that God will indeed fulfill these promises and to maintain that act of prayer until it happens. Um, and uh, the prophet makes a personal commitment to prayer, and the prophet's commissions uh, commissions other people to make a uh, nuisance of themselves to God until the time of fulfillment comes. So it's uh, make a new meaning, meaning sort of pray without ceasing, right? Jesus' parable of the friend who comes at midnight and pesters the guy uh, to get up and help him show some hospitality to late arriving strangers. And this is what God, Jesus, tells us to do in prayer, be persistent. All right. Um, in 62 verses 10, verses 10 through 12, the prophet commissions some people to leave the city and construct a road. Uh, and this imagery is very familiar in the Old Testament. Uh, this road is reworked, however, in a new direction. Uh, and uh, the road is for the people to return to Jerusalem. Um, and uh, the declaration is designed to help the people of Jerusalem understand that God is committed to bringing his people back to the holy city. All right, we get to our last chapter for today, 63. Um, and the prophet imagines in here in the beginning chapter, an anonymous questioner asking about an impressive warrior who arrives covered in blood, covered in red, I should say. It's covered in red, we're told, but it suggests blood. Um, though it is literally grape juice, um, he comes from the direction of Edom. Um, and now this doesn't necessarily mean he's fighting Edom. In fact, the last verse, uh, verse six here, indicates that it's not so unless Edom stands for nations in general. The figure turns out to be God himself who has acted to do right by Israel, to put down these nations and thus redeem, restore Israel, because no one else was doing so. And now we get a second prayer that uh, starts in 63.7. Um, it sometime elapses before the character of this prayer becomes clear. 
but the passage implies that the temple is still in ruins, which may suggest the prayer originally belonged in the uh, period of the exile before the Israelites came back. Um, its presence here reflects uh, the sense running, running through uh, that the exile continues into what is often called what I've referred to as the post exile period. Um, so uh, this prayer uh, is a, sort of a twofold review of Israel's story. It recalls God's deeds at the Exodus, though Israel's hope that they would, though Yahweh hopes, God hopes that they would respond to such an expression of love was disappointed. Uh, God's chastisement won their return and God uh, delivered them again at the Red Sea. And yet that raises the question why God is not relating to them in this way now. Their experience in the exile and after the exile is very different from the experience of their ancestors. The references here to God's Holy Spirit, also the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Yahweh in the Hebrew uh, are worth noting. Uh, the phrase Holy Spirit comes to us in the Old Testament uh, only here and in Psalm 51, David's prayer of repentance. Um, it makes clear that God's Holy Spirit was active in Israel, though the phrase is really not a technical term in the Old Testament. Uh, it will become a, a tech, technical and doctrinal term in the New Testament. Now, at this point in chapter 63, starting with verse 15, the passage becomes overtly a prayer uh, addressing God in light of the difference between God's activity in Israel Israel's life at the beginning and God's behavior now. Uh, the prophet moves between speaking as I and as we once again. And so what we have here is a prayer that the prophet articulates on behalf of God's people. Uh, as happens in the Psalms, uh, the first thing the prayer seeks is God's attention uh, in a way that is, that is all that's necessary, right? Because if the people gain God's attention, Surely God will respond. So the prayer looks up to God's heavenly dwelling and urges God to look down on what is happening or not happening uh, in Israel. Uh, their unrestored uh, state means that uh, their great father figures, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would not recognize them uh, because they have paled in comparison to what they once were. If God is their father and also their redeemer, then certain actions should follow. Uh, in uh, the typically bold nature of Israelite prayer, and when we went through the Psalms, we saw the bold nature of Israel, is the, the prayers of the psalmists. The people actually accuse God of making them stray from God's ways and hardening their hearts as if they were the Egyptians and not the Israelites. Remember, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, accusing God in this way uh, risks the danger of excusing uh, themselves, but it does take seriously the fact that God is Lord, a ruler who is responsible for Yahweh's people. And always reminder to us that prayer is about honesty with God, and that's important. All right, friends, let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for the gift of this day, for the ability to pray. Help us to be honest in our prayers to you, to uh, tell you our feelings uh, in the good times as well as the difficult times. Uh, make our prayer prayers a true dialogue as we speak with you and then as we listen uh, for your response. Hear our prayers this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Hasta mañana.